Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you guys all enjoyed that as much as I did. That was a, that was a hell of a lot of fun. This was my first time. It was great. Um, my name is Mike Chambers. Uh, I'm a visual effects producer, and I'm the, uh, the chair of the, uh, of the Visual Effects Society, and I want to thank you all for coming out today. Um, we're here in the, in the main theater at Walt Disney Studios in Burbank, California, and we're also broadcasting live uh, for venues in uh, VES sections in the San Francisco Bay Area, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, New York, and London. We're also recording this panel so our VS members can have access to this uh, later on on our website. Um, before we get started, I wanted to thank a few people for making, making this day happen. Um, big thank you to Walt Disney Studios for providing all the prints and all the screenings today and for hosting us in this theater. Um, and uh, for hosting the screenings in our other locations, I'd like to uh, uh, thank a few folks. Industrial Light and Magic in their premier theater in San Francisco. Uh, 3210 Studios for their C Studio, or uh, C Theater in San Rafael. Uh, Capilano University's Bossa Center Theater in Vancouver. Uh, the Royal Theater in Toronto. Uh, Technicolor's uh, Covitec Screening Room in Montreal. And the Science Museum's uh, IMAX Theater in London. Big thanks to, uh, for their support in, in hosting this. Um, for those of you uh, here uh, or any of the audiences live, uh, you, can, uh, you can Twitter, you can tweet your questions to us, which we'll uh, ask of, the, uh, of our panelists. Um, be sure to include hashtag VES Star Wars. Okay, let's get on to the good stuff. We've got some real rock stars here today. So it is my honor to... Uh, introduce our esteemed panel. Uh, please welcome VES award-winning visual effects supervisor, Pat Tubach. Uh, VES Oscar and BAFTA award-winning special effects supervisor, Chris Corbold. Academy, Academy award-winning uh, creature effects supervisor, Neil Scanlon. And finally, our very special guest, VES Visionary Award-winning director, J.J. Abrams. How are you doing? Good to see you. Chris, how are you? Nice to see you again. Come on in, have a seat. That was a visual effects extravaganza. I love that, I love that, thank you guys. Um, uh, we're gonna, I know we're gonna have a lot of questions here, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, thank you guys for showing up here. Um, I'm still spinning, I'm still spinning from the film. I really, really had a great time. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, so this was, this was great. Um, generally, you know, the first thing I wanted to ask you guys, um, this is such a, was such an uh, iconic and beloved property. You guys must have felt a lot of responsibility to that going into this, and I wonder how that how that uh, drove you, and how that how that's how it manifested itself here. The work you've done. Do you want to start? <laughs> Why don't you start? That? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one thing that I um, I was keenly aware of is you know ILM's history, and and being at ILM, I've been there for. Uh, 16 years now, and uh, I started on, um, uh, you know, r early in my career at ILM, I started on episode two and episode three, and, you know, working with George and having that sort of connection to Star Wars, which for me, like, I still remember the moment where uh, I got the call to come to ILM, and it was just mind-blowing to me, and of course, I ran to the phone and told my mother, I'm going to work at the place that did Star Wars, you know, and it was like that, you get that huge, uh, <clears throat> that nostalgic sort of, like, everything about your childhood comes rushing back, you know. So going into this film, it was like that all just comes right back to, you know, that you just feel that huge responsibility of, you know, the legacy of the great films, the legacy of ILM, which is, which is really wrapped up in these films. And, um, you know, you want to keep that going forward and you want to have, you want it to be successful, of course, but more than that, you just want everyone to love it, you know. And I, I you know, thank God the response has been great and I feel like um, it, 
it really was meaningful to a lot of the artists that worked on it. So, Very good. Chris, how about you? Yeah, no, I think working on, uh, for me, it was a, a real dream to uh, come on to Force Awakens and... Uh, uh, I think part of the biggest problem for me on the film is uh, keeping up with JJ's energy. He's like a whirlwind making the film and um, keeping up with his um, his ideas uh, was great. And we had some good times in it. And it was, I think um, JJ had this great mantra about a, using the new hope as a starting point, as a guide to us all, but uh, putting as much practically as we as we could. You know, with, with Neil, um, we had a great time out in the desert. We did some fantastic stuff out there. Uh, and it was a great place to do it uh, because we, the, the nearest house was like 30 miles away, so we didn't have to worry about breaking windows or neighbours complaining. Um, so we we would really go to town on the, on the uh, the strafing sequence that we did there. And it was great getting um, John and Daisy involved in it. Uh, it was, it's very important to me to, to to get the main actors involved in all the explosions. Uh, I mean, there is a knock-on effect to that that you have to keep testing, 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 and make sure that everything's in place. But uh, they were great. They did a great run th through it, and uh, I think it really shows on the screen. But it was a real thrill working on Star Wars. It was a, a dream come true for me. JJ, if you don't mind, I'd like to go to you. I mean, what did this mean to you? This was, uh, this is huge. I mean, well, uh, do you mind? Look, I want to hear what Neil has to say first. Absolutely. Because, yeah. because uh, I'm, I'll probably want to just correct him. No, I'm kidding. No, I just I want to hear what you have to say in it because I, I just I, I, I want I don't want to be sycophantic, but I want to make sure I get to speak for for a moment about the the experience of working with with all of you. But but please, Neil. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I mean, you know, because I you know our field is is creatures, and you know one has to say that in the in you know recent years, the advent of digital technology has been uh, you know such an incredible medium. Um, there are, uh, you know, not as many films these days, it has to be said, that use or desire practical effects. And uh, I think the opportunity uh, for me to work on Star Wars was that it is one, uh, re it certainly is a, a world that still remains where practical effects um, uh, are possible. In fact, they're not just possible, they're, they're desired. Um, I can't think of uh, many other films where you can, you know, put somebody in a, a, a small square box with a pair of feet sticking out the bottom and the audience will accept and love it rather than criticise you for that. Um, so it's a tremendous uh, uh, arena to, uh, you know, really enjoy uh, your imagination and try and do things um, uh, that, um, uh, you know, maybe, as I say, are, are not possible in other films. It's also uh, an incredible opportunity because uh, working with ILM and working with the digital side, um, the limits of practical effects uh, uh, have now become somewhat less limited in the fact that if we reach a point where we really can't uh, pull this off uh, in camera, we can lean on the digital side uh, and these guys come in and fix all the problems for us. So we're going to look good either which way. So it, it's, it was for that reason alone, other than obviously the love uh, for the project and, um, uh, and that desire to sort of put it back on the screen in the way that the fans would accept rather than send hate mail to me, uh, was, was the reason why, absolutely. Very good. Well, I was gonna, first of all, thank you all for, for being here. Um, I, the experience of working with these men and <clears throat> others and the women who worked uh, so hard for so long on this movie, <clears throat> it was an extraordinary experience and uh, to a person. I think everyone who was there was there not because it was a job, but because it was a passion. It was something that they all, we all wanted to make it great for ourselves, for our kids, for our parents who took us, for our family members who worked on the original films, not my personally, but a lot of people on the crew had family that had worked on the original films. Um, and the, the visual effects in, in this movie uh, were unbelievable to see developed. And uh, equally amazing was watching the practical effects in that scene where Ray and Finn and BB-8 are hauling ass uh, in, in the desert <clears throat> to the ship that, that blows up in front of them. That shot that you're seeing that was shot on IMAX, it was essentially 98% in camera. Uh, we added, of course, the, the TIE fighters later and the blasts. Um, and that was one of the uh, handful of shots where BB-8 was a digital BB-8 um, rolling along. But it was an amazing thing to see that done practically in Abu Dhabi for real with these actors running uh, through these incredible but uh, impossibly well-controlled uh, explosions. Um, in other scenes, watching uh, you know, uh, 
Dave and Brian performing BB-8, uh, which Neil and his team built uh, in every shot. And <clears throat> then we, you know, uh, mercilessly painted out uh, Brian, uh, who was sweating in 130 degree heat, you know, racing along with, uh, with BB-8 in, in, in all these shots. But it was an amazing thing to see the passion and to see how the, uh, the evolution and, and the uh, technology, which has advanced so much in visual effects uh, and in digital, the digital realm, uh, was matched in many ways by the uh, ad advance, advancements in practical effects and seeing what Neil and his team was capable of doing. So, uh, sorry, it's boring, but... Um, <laughs> being honest, but... Um, no, you, you guys will be back, I know, it's, it's all cool. Uh, but uh, in any event, uh, I'll shut up. But it was, a, it was an honor to work with these, with these people and, uh, and to see what was possible on, on set in camera. Uh, it went beyond what I thought could have been done. And then to see what you guys did with, uh, at ILM with uh, different simulations and things that I know were pushing the edge of the envelope, but what was possible was incredible to see. So everywhere I looked on this movie, uh, from working with Larry Kazin to working with John Williams, uh, everyone on this movie worked so hard to do, I think, an extraordinary job. Definitely an extraordinary job. Uh, you guys kind of uh, jumped into a question I was going to ask a little later, but I'll, I'll just carry on here. Um, you know, the, clearly there was a, a ton of practical effects as well as digital effects, uh, and they seemed to really just blend so seamlessly. Um, what, what were the, what areas, what, what effects, what practical things were the biggest challenge to make that work well? The biggest challenge for me was the, uh, the bread gag. <laughs> <laughs> you know that bread that, that she puts <laughs> into the water? That was all done in camera. Yeah. It, it, was, uh, it went backwards and forwards between uh, JJ and myself, and it's like, make it a little bit faster, a little bit slower, a little bit more liquid. That, that took about four months to shoot, or f to, to, to uh, perfect that gag. But uh, no, that was, a, that was a fun gag, that one. Well, and I, I think the general philosophy is, is just shoot it when you can, you know, and I think that's one thing that, you know, luckily JJ allows people to, to sort of stretch themselves and say, you know, what can we possibly do for real? And up until the point where you decide, okay, this is, it, it's not just whether it's convenient or, or cost saving, it's, it's more about like, how is this gonna look and what's gonna give us the most tangible sort of result? And I think these guys did an awesome job just sort of taking it up right up into the edge of what isn't gonna work, you know? And, um, and then that's where we can jump in and, and, and help with those things. But I think having the, the mantra of, let's just go out there and just do it if we can, why not do it if you can, you know, is, is the best way to approach these things. And it gives you the best result. On, on, the, on the digital side, what, were the, what, what, uh, what work was most challenging and what's most rewarding for you, for you guys? Um, yeah, and actually, let me just jump in and say, Roger uh, Gayette, who's our, our lead visual effects supervisor, he really Thank wanted you. to be here. I apologize that he couldn't be here, and, and uh, he said sorry. And if you know Roger, he says he loves you all, and you know, and he actually. Means we're, it. we're sorry we didn't have him as well. But, yeah, uh, um, but glad you guys could be. But here. It, on the, on you know the, it's so hard to pick out any one particular thing that is is sort of the, the what was the best effect. But I, I think that we all had, you know. A really good time, um, you know, working on the, the Falcon Chase was, was one of the things that we started very early on, and it was kind of, it, it, it took, you know, pretty much the entire length of the production to kind of get the whole thing done, because there was so much work in that sequence, but for us that was really exciting, because it, it, it's just this really exciting action moment in the movie, and you're flying just the iconic ship, the Millennium Falcon is, is sort of that thing that everybody wants to touch it. You know, when you're, when you're working on these films, everybody jockeys for it, how can I get these, these great shots? And any time there's a Falcon shot, everybody wants to be involved, you know, it's, it's, it just means that much to everyone, so. Great, great. Um, I'm sure we got, in fact, he's telling me, yes, we got a ton of questions, so why don't we get to some of these? Uh, ben, why don't we start out with a Twitter question? The uh, question from Twitter that is asked over and over is uh, using practical versus CG effects. Uh, what were the benefits and the drawbacks and what was the hardest of uh, CG? Um, maybe I could answer. I think you know, there's a slight uh, problem in that, that it's uh, practical versus uh, digital. I think that we never at one time 
uh, well, certainly publicly, <laughs> ever admitted that there was a competition between the two mediums. I think that the thing is, is to try, I think in the world of practical effects, we've been through some incredible things in the world of animatronics. If you look at something like Jurassic Park, which probably reached the, the ultimate in, in a, an animatronic version of a Tyrannosaurus. But that was an in incredibly complex creature and, and, and brought with it a huge amount of infrastructure to require, you know, uh, in, in a way is that a criticism, but I think what we did with uh, uh, Force Awakens was to try and go back and look at uh, much more simple, simple ways, much more theatre-based ways, uh, uh, ways that we could literally take something to Abu Dhabi and uh, put it in a desert and make it work. So there's as much a trick to practical effects as what, what, how do you build it, how do you perform it, but a bigger trick is how do you actually make that work under the constraints of modern filmmaking, where you don't have the time uh, necessary to dedicate your, uh, uh, to a particular setup. You need to be quick, you need to be efficient. So uh, as Patrick is sort of saying, I think you know, the idea is, is you try to achieve as much as you can practically. Uh, and there, there is an obvious cutoff point. There are places where the physicality of something or just the reality of it um, uh, says to you, and Maz is a good example of a character like that, where you know, the choice is, 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 is a creative choice, where you look and you, you, you sort of say the best way of executing this is to use a medium, uh, the, the, the very finest medium that we have, and that's a, the, the digital medium. So um, you know, I think we really do try to uh, bring those two together in very much which is a tradition that ILM is, 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 is famous for and, and built its reputation on. I wanted to build a real flying X-Jet, but I was overruled. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing uh, I would just like to add is that uh, I think the important thing that we try to do is approach every sequence, every, every scene and every shot um, asking what are we trying to do? What is the goal of this moment? <clears throat> and it's not just about a visual thing where you say this is what you're trying to do. It's, it, it was about uh, this feeling. We needed people to believe, for an example, the, the BB-8 was alive and tangible and practical and real. And it wasn't just about how to make it look that way, but it was what will be best for uh, the actors, what will be best for the story, how will you believe it the most. And, and with Daisy Ridley, who is extraordinary, and <clears throat> John, and who's also great, the rest of the cast, having uh, BB-8 as a physical and tangible performer allowed the scenes with, uh, with BB-8 and, and whoever else happened to be in the scene to come alive and, and be something that was there and not th something that needed to be figured out, performed, fixed later. It had to be finished. We had to get rid of the rig and the, the puppeteer, of course, but <clears throat> it was an amazing thing to see the, how alive he was and how the interactions between this uh, this character that happened to be a droid and the other actors was you could see what what takes were working because it was happening right there. Um, that was a you know an incredible thing to see work and characters like Unkar Plutt, who's the her boss. That was Simon Pegg in a wonderful uh, costume and and makeup. Uh, that then had some facial animation done, and that was a great example of what Neil's talking about, which is it wasn't one versus the other, it's what's the best tool for not just every shot, but every piece of every shot, and how do we best bring these things to life? Sometimes there were, there were aliens where there were blinks that were put in later if they hadn't had it on set. Other places, uh, like that giant hapabore, the creature that's drinking out of the trough that knocks over John Boyega, that was practical. That was all there on set in Abu Dhabi, five uh, people who hate us uh, in, <laughs> in this costume, in that heat, uh, and, and th the CG work was done to remove the human legs that were sticking out uh, from under him. And so it, it, was, it was always a question of how do we best get this thing that we need in the moment to moment uh, using all means necessary. Fantastic. Uh, do we have any questions here in the room? Right over here in the, in the middle. I'll go ahead and repeat it for, so the audience. <coughs> was the final scene a real location shot, and where was it? Uh, it was on uh, Skellig Michael in Ireland, off the uh, western coast of Ireland, and it was uh, essentially in camera. We added some of, but not all of, the islands that you see in the distance, and we could have 50 people uh, on the island, and 
you saw the entire island. Uh, that was it. And it was, we had three days to shoot there. Uh, and the weather was eerily, impossibly gorgeous for those three days. It almost never happens, and no one who works and lives there could understand it or believe it. Um, and one more thing is that all the birds you see flying around, uh, there were some that were added later, but many of them were real. There were puffins, and we showed up, and there were about, uh, I think, like 200 million puffins. I mean, I, it was more puffins, you know, even the puffins were like, God, there are a lot of puffins around, you know. Um, and, uh, and then the next day we showed up to shoot for the second day, and they were all gone. And it just happened, we arrived on their last day before, I guess, they fly somewhere else to, I guess, Puffin Island. I don't know where they go. <laughs> Very good. Uh, right up here in the front. <coughs> How was the uh, interaction with the DP during, I mean, both uh, uh, heavy compositing and, and full CG sequences? How do you involve the DP and his view so the, so the full CG sequences look as merged with the, with the rest of the movie? Well, uh, I, I know that Dan uh, Mendel and, and Roger, I mean, they're, they, obviously they've worked together a lot they're, and they're very good friends as well. And, and I just think that um, Roger has a lot of respect for Dan and, and just his, his process and, and kind of, um, I, I don't know if you call it, uh, well, Dan's got a very, uh, in my mind, a very positive uh, outlook on how the movie should look. And I, and I think that he brings that into the photography and then we're just constantly referencing what, what he's doing on set. And, and always looking at how he's lighting and just using color to, you know, draw out the, the best possible look of the scenes. I mean, one of the greatest things about the movie is it just doesn't look bland ever. You know, it just looks amazing. And um, I think we just try to take that forward into everything and then, you know, involve him, you know, when we can and, and, um, and just keep, ju just try to keep that realness of the locations and the, the sort of um, the boldness of the onset lighting kind of translating into everything that we're doing. But we're really just taking our cues off of everything that was shot on the day. And from the Twitterverse. Um, can you point to any practical stop motion animation other than the monster chess? Mm, I believe that was it. I believe that, the, yeah, that was the only uh, stop motion in the film. And then what was the choice for uh, shooting film instead of digitally? Well, for me, the, knowing how much of this movie would be relying on digital visual effects, um, one of the things I've learned from Roger, and this is our fourth collaboration, uh, and, and with, also with Dan Mindel, um, is the more that you have as reference, the better. You know, Roger would rather us go out and shoot something even if 2% of the final shot will have an element in it if, if he has, uh, if you guys have the light, the reference, anything that's real. So I just felt that film was going to do a, a couple important things. One, I think <clears throat> that there's just magic in film. I, uh, there's a lot of data that tells you the dynamic range of, of digital is, you know, all these things. And I like digital also. But for this movie specifically, it felt like uh, there is a, a difficult to quantify uh, magic and romance and uh, in, in film. And I think it's the best medium to capture an image. And I just felt like if we could capture this movie on film, it, not just in the visual effects shots, but everywhere we, we possibly could, it would give the movie a standard that all the digital work would live up to. It's one of Roger's many uh, gifts in the entire uh, CG visual effects uh, team. Uh, which has always been matching the look and the feel of what uh, of the, the shots they're getting. So it felt to me that film was going to be the way that digital would have to uh, match that standard. And also it felt like the original uh, trilogy was shot on film. And I really wanted this to feel as much as possible like you were going back to that time and place. And it felt like a lot of work that I would rather not be putting, you know, and having other people put uh, into the movie would have to be put into to achieve that look. Film would just give it to us. And, uh, and one final thing is we've all seen really beautifully shot digital uh, productions. We've, we've seen horribly shot uh, film productions. There's no rule that film makes it better. But when you have artists like Dan Mendel and uh, these incredible people working on a movie, uh, it felt like it was the, the best way to capture that work. And uh, I think that it, it's very hard sometimes to tell uh, 
even for us sometimes working on this movie as long as we have, remembering what is real <clears throat> and what wasn't real, but the standard of what was on film uh, at least gave us a certain kind of quality to adhere to. Uh, you'd mentioned that you shot some on IMAX. How much, how much IMAX film did you shoot? Just the sequence uh, of the, the, the Falcon chase from uh, the moment that they're, she says, you know, take my hand, uh, and they're on the run. That whole sequence up through the ship flying off was, was shot uh, IMAX, and of course, much of that sequence is is digital, uh, but the you know all those all those shots that whole sequence was the intention was to shoot that IMAX and we would have done more, <clears throat> but uh, the truth is that, that working with IMAX cameras, which I've done in the past, uh, it, the film cameras are unwieldy. They're they're loud. It, it, they do make it more difficult. Um, and I know that you know Chris, you have a lot of experience working on that stuff too. It's just a, it, it's it's a it's a difficult uh, camera to, you know. Use. Understood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have anybody else here in the room? There's a in the middle, and then over on the on the other aisle. Um, you the the space battle sequences are I guess they're not quite in space. Um, are it, there's a lot going on in those shots, and I know in the original Star Wars a lot of them were in space or against the Death Star, which is sort of monocolor. Um, could you guys talk a little bit on the visual effects about, and, and maybe JJ, about your approach to how do you keep it from getting so busy and, and, and um, detailed that you lose track of what's going on in the action and, and the play of the story? Well, I think, um, yeah, there is, there is the, the moment where um, they have to go back up into space to um, you know, sort of wait out the moment where they finally, um, Han and Chewie, breach the, the oscillator down there. And, and, uh, you know, in, in those sort of moments where I think the one thing you're always aware of is, is are we telling the story that we're trying to tell and uh, can everybody tell what's going on? And I think, um, I mean, obviously JJ keeps us on track with that and just monitoring sort of, you know, when he sees something for the first time, do I even understand what's going on here? Because that's something that I think visual effects artists, you can kind of lose track of and you're putting all the ships in and you're getting cool animation in there and then you show it to somebody and for the first time, do they really get what you're trying to say? So I think it's just a process of... Um, Making sure that you know when you when you do have a planet in the background or you do have ships flying by and you have all these you know things going on, um, laser blasts behind and everything that you're just keeping the intention of the shot clear. Um, and I think um, you know just having having everybody on board with um, the storyline. And I think you know story is what definitely drives this this film through. And I think that um, you know the visuals should never and and don't overshadow the story. So I think that's. that's it. Good. Um, there was someone right over, right over here. Yes. What was the role of previs in relation to the effects, and how was it used specifically? I guess to compare with when it was first used in the original. Well, we uh, we prevised a, a few sequences, uh, and. Um, you know, a lot of times previs is is is, is done. And we have some amazing people working on it. Uh, you know, it's done so you can start to have a common language about what's actually going to happen. It's difficult, even with storyboards, sometimes to really be clear on how something's going to feel and look. And one of the great advantages of, of previs is you can actually be watching something and realize, oh, that whole section, given the rhythm of it, we don't really need that. And all of a sudden, you realize you're n now not having to do six shots that you thought you'd have to do. Um, the, the downside to previs, uh, at least for us, was because we didn't have an enormous amount of prep time given when we started, when we were going to be shooting, um, the, uh, I think putting in the effort to make the previs work is, is, is enormous. And at a certain point, you just spend your, so much time doing the previs that a lot of other stuff that needs to get done, if you don't have the time, can't get done. And my, my biggest issue with previs is that when you do have something to reference, it seems to become inadvertently sort of gospel, meaning people look at it, they don't quite know what piece of the previs is the essential piece. So I always prefer, if possible, to do something that feels almost more sketchy, where it's like, it's, it's the feeling of it and the idea of it, and people can start talking about the practic practicality of how we're gonna do it, what elements need to be shot, what things would be CG, you know, but there's that weird thing that, that you know, you start to look at something 
and people start to say, oh, this is how it needs to look. This is how it needs to be. A, a little sort of corollary is that we were working on a set and we were looking at the set as it was being built and we realized that the set had been designed <clears throat> in, a, um, it, it, in the computer, in a, in a CAD program, and it was being built to match the kind of cleanliness of what was done in CG, meaning it wasn't just blueprints and then a painting that then the artists and, and, and you know, construction crew could co sort of interpret. And I think that the interpretation is the magic in all this, meaning every step of the way, there's not an artist on this movie of the thousands of names you saw at the end of the film that wasn't absolutely critical. And when that person, when he or she can put themselves into it and interpret it, 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 it starts to add, it's, it's all additive. And, it's, it's, and to me, what's interesting is when you start to adhere to something, even a beautifully previous sequence, there's something almost mechanical in the process. And, and so I, I love previs when there's time to do it right and when people can in interpret it as their own thing. I think it can be dangerous in a kind of a coloring book way where you're getting something and you're sort of painting by numbers and sort of trying to match exactly this thing that was in previs because there's always a better, more interesting idea that's just around the corner, and there's always something that, that, that can be missed if you're just too rigid and following something that's, be, that's been done. So there were a handful of sequences that we did. It helped enormously, but I just think that there are sort of dangers to previs as essential as it is that I just think need to be, you need to be mindful of. Um, and that's, I mean, you didn't ask my opinion about previs, but I, I thought we were, we're hanging out. I thought I'd give it to you. So. <laughs> And I, and I think sometimes it's more useful for us as a tool of just being able to have an initial conversation with everyone and, and then just leave it at that, you know, meaning we just, we need to get everybody on board with, here's an idea, and like, and like JJ was saying, it's, it's a rough sketch and don't get attached to it. We're gonna look at it this one time and then we're gonna put it away and we're never gonna look at it again. But you just have to get people, oh, okay, there's ships, there's a planet, there's a, and then you just kind of go from there. And, and it, it is very useful for that because a lot of times people just need a clue. You know, what am I doing? You know, what are we talking about? But you do want the artist to actually think for themselves. And the last thing you want is for them to be looking at something and going, you want this. And it's like, I didn't, not really. You know, I want something like that, but so. Guidance only. Yeah, exactly. Ben? How many uh, CG characters were there throughout the film? Um, how was it, Neil, to uh, take over for the Henson crew? Um, and what went into the choice of uh, making Snoke uh, animated through uh, mocap? That was, that was three questions. <laughs> so how many CG characters? Well, so there's, I mean, there's, main, there's two main, um, Maz and Snoke, obviously. Um, and then um, we did some enhancement on some other creatures. But I mean, the, uh, there's so many practical creatures in the, in the film. I, I think there's way more, you know, for instance, the bar scene, right? You, you had quite a number. Um, yeah, that, that, that scene where they go into Maz's castle, uh, they walk in, just uh, interrupt for a second. It's like, it, that was in camera. Every creature that you're seeing there was practical except Maz, and then you get to Maz and she turns around, and, and that was sort of that adhering to what was real. That creature needed to look like, you know, the, these other creatures that were being photographed, and we had a maquette that was a beautifully uh, uh, built and, and painted maquette that we had on, on set that we would shoot, and it was an amazing thing to actually look back uh, at some of that reference material and to see how much uh, the CG matched that practical thing. It was really remarkable. I think um, all in all there was 110 aliens that we made, um, and droids, so, um, and they were all of, uh, we include all of those, the creatures as well, and so um, it's a rough idea of how they work so that you know is that most of them are performed by a, a, what we call a performer, uh, for want of a better word, so that's a physical person inside, and then there is a second performer who uh, communicates with that person who is are often their eyes because they can't see the world around them and uh, that's a really interesting thing because uh, it, it, the person who's uh, performing the creature becomes almost internalized they uh, start to um, uh, sort of perform this thing in the way uh, that is uh, uh, a sort of an extension of themselves so uh, it's a fascinating uh, thing to see them work and the outside uh, person is the person who's controlling the animatronic facial features so the two of them work as a team 
And then there's a third person who is our, what we call our movement director, who is coordinating all of those people. So in, in Massey's Castle, for instance, there may be as many as 30 aliens at one time. Uh, that all of those 30 people are listening to this one person who's helping direct them and let them know where the camera is at any one time. The performers themselves, or the puppeteers as we call them, are looking through monitors or sighting them directly and are performing to the camera. So as the camera, um, uh, as the creature comes into shot, then they will, they will up their performance, and then as the creature falls away, then obviously they'll, they'll, they'll bring it down. So it's, 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 a, it's a huge bit of theater, um, and um, it's, uh, everyone has their own little backstory, so each character, uh, we would give them a little backstory. For instance, there are two characters we call Nip and Tuck. Uh, they're cosmetic surgeons who are, uh, um, have these little, little hands, and so that helps everybody get into the idea of, of what they are and that, that means that when we show JJ um, uh, the characters he doesn't hopefully we're showing him uh, not these sort of static uh, lifeless things that are on a sort of catwalk uh, we're showing him uh, characters in their own right, uh, little little creatures, little uh, aliens, big aliens, or whatever. But they have their own. They're, they're, they're hopefully they're perceived as actors, um, and it, I think hopefully um, uh, makes them uh, you know uh, uh, not a special effect. They are just part of that that particular scene. Well, it's one of the amazing things that Neil, uh, that you and your team did is is giving these creatures attitudes. I mean, when when. Ray is dragging her sled of stuff after you meet her, um, and there's that giant guy with the yellow, you know, sort of pulling the, the his own sled. That was practical, and 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 he and the the idea we talked about was, we need to see that Ray is just like everyone else there, and they work their asses off, and then th the idea of having this giant guy doing the same thing as as this young woman, you know, um, you know that creature. It, it just it, it was a weird thing. It helped. Daisy's performance, she sort of got what it was doing. This creature had a kind of attitude of, this is my life. I lug this stuff every day, you know, and it just, it, it, was, it was great for the moment. It was great for her uh, when, when BB-8, when she rescues BB-8, and there's that, there's that guy, the alien, uh, uh, who's uh, Tito, who's on, on top of that giant sort of semi-mechanical beast. That was all practical. Um, there were two uh, performers in the beast, there was a little person, Kieran, sitting on top of the beast, um, and again, it, it allowed Daisy to actually interact with this creature that was there. He had this, you know, great attitude, this sort of angry, um, you know, attitude that it helped her. And these were just things that none of these felt like uh, anything other than another actor, another performer, and to a creature, to a droid, it it, it helped make the scene. Uh, better, if not just because the actors were actually doing it, you know, it was it was priceless. It became a secret ambition of my department to blow up as many of ra uh, Neil's radio-controlled droids as we could. <laughs> Whenever we were in the dis Star Destroyer and saw a little radio control thing, we always used to aim in this uh, pyrotechnic towards it. I often say that we make it and Chris destroys it. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Congratulations on a beautiful film. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was wondering how much work you had to do for ancillary products. Obviously, uh, you're doing breakdowns and, and elements for 3D, but also how much for future films, how much for ancillary stuff like uh, theme park and other um, things that are going to be spun off of this that are already, you know, they've been in the plans from the beginning. Um, I, on the creature side, it, it's been amazing because um, uh, we're, you know, something like BB-8, for instance, uh, as uh, JJ is describing, the BB-8 in the film was nearly all, always performed. Um, to just towards the end of the film, we made a version that we call the red carpet version of BB-8, which is the one that you've seen trundling around with no assistance. So that's a that's a, a development that we hopefully now will work with Imagineering on and 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 develop that to a, a place where he can actually go in, he or she, uh, BB-8, uh, can go into a theme park and and become a, a completely uh, automatous uh, droid. Uh, I think again, helping um, uh, you know merchandising. Every character was scanned, um, and so that they could be reproduced as really accurate toys. Um, so all of those things are catalogued. And again, moving ahead, hopefully for you know theme park times that we can we can help design and and and, and bring forward 
uh, uh, more things. So um, it, our world is, has become much larger than I ever expected. Uh, it's a privilege of working with Disney. Uh, is that you know uh, it, the, the branches are, uh, are, are widespread. Um, so we're just beginning to sort of take. Uh, take stock of a little bit of those things, but I think there, there is a great synergy between uh, uh, what we did for the film and what will eventually come out in, in, in other areas as well, yeah. At, uh, at ILM, we're uh, also just constantly involved in the, you know, the, the commercial um, side of things, and, and, you know, Lucasfilm and Disney care very much about the brand and just making sure there's a tremendous amount of questions about what things are right, you know, and so just having having all that stuff roll through and, be, and being able to consult on that stuff and um, talk to people about how to make it look as, as much like the film as possible is you know, kind of an ever-present thing, so quite a lot. Good. Someone right in the middle there uh, and also a couple in the back. Thank you. Um, the, the last uh, sword battle sequence in the snow forest is really extraordinary and uh, uh, the chasm opens up and the earth falls in. I think that was just really wonderful integration of, um, I can't tell if I'm, I heard some of us on set, it must be a huge set. How was that done with that, uh, that chasm? And secondly, um, were you in high school with Rick Carter, our director, Rick Carter? Didn't he go to your high school? And did he know Mrs. Gilbert? Uh, <laughs> could someone escort him out, please? This is getting <laughs> way too personal. No. Uh, first of all, thank you for your kind words about the uh, the, the sequence. Uh, Rick and I did go to the same high school, uh, some years apart. But we, uh, sorry. Oh, you did? Did you have Rose Gilbert as a teacher? You did? Oh, really? Um, well, she, she Rose Gilbert was this incredible teacher at at uh, at Palisades High School, and she was an English teacher, and she was a a sort of small, uh, brilliant. She's like one of the wise figures that that uh, if, if you know if you're lucky enough to have her as a teacher. And I'm sorry you didn't have her because she was she was an amazing presence and someone who I I mentioned one day in in when we were developing the story, and Rick <laughs> said I had Rose Gilbert. I was like, you're kidding me. And we just had this kind of Rose Gilbert. Now Neil's leaving. He's so bored. He can't stand it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, Anyway, so we based Maz Kanata on Rose Gilbert, and she she stopped teaching at uh, I think 91 years old. She passed away at 94 while we were developing the story. We were going to bring her in and show her what we were doing, uh, and she passed away. Rick and I went to her memorial. We sat together, and um, this woman got up to talk about Rose, who she had known for 10 years and traveled to the Amazon with and all this stuff. And she met Rose when she was 85 years old and had a, a decade of, of, you know, she was an amazing character. So, uh, you know, anyway, so yes, uh, Rose Gilbert, uh, this is hopefully something that uh, she's smiling about. But um, the, the, the sequence was shot in, uh, on a, an enormous uh, set in, uh, at Pinewood Studios. And it was a, a beautiful, hugely challenging uh, to light set that Dan and his team, I think, uh, handled brilliantly. But it's an incredible, enormous uh, snowy forest. And we, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I think we shot every possible angle. What was incredible was because, you know, when I did the, the, the pilot for Lost, uh, I discovered very early on that, that jungle is jungle is jungle, meaning you can move the camera and put it everywhere you want. But the truth is, um, People, you can't tell the difference, uh, really, from one area of a jungle to another. So, what we discovered fairly early on is we could, you know, we could have a camera here and we could just go, whoo, like, barely pan the camera, and you'd be in a whole different part of the of the forest, and you'd never know. So, there are some places where I watch and I remember um, that, you know, these different shots that were taking place all over this big forest were actually all in the same place. Um, the amazing, and you should speak to the the effect, but the we had. Uh, uh, at an edge of the of the set that was um, uh, we used for a breakaway piece that we practically broke away and digitally enhanced for when she's oh, on the edge of the thing um, being pushed back by by Kylo, um, but the the giant breakaway uh, that you see, especially the overhead shot, was one of the uh, the simulations I was talking about. The, the the amount of work and computing power that went into it, in addition to the unbelievable 
artistry. Uh, it was it was an incredible thing to see, uh, it just iteratively, iteratively uh, how that shot developed. But you, you got to talk about it because it was just. Uh, one of the many amazing things you guys did. It, it was, it did turn out to be one of the harder things in the film. And, um, <clears throat> and, and I think we knew going in it was gonna be hard, but once you start to get into it, you, you just realize how actually difficult it is because you, ha you involved, you know, we have a, um, a rigid effects sort of team that handles sort of the rigid body simulations. And then we have the particle effects team and you have the, you know, the, tr the um, the environment team modeling the trees and everything, and all the trees needed to fall. They needed to hit everything else. The, the, the snow needed to react to all of that. The snow needed to fall off the trees. So it was this massive, uh, became this massive thing of going back and forth between different departments and, and artists' hands. And I remember one day looking outside my office and I sit sort of facing the door and there was this huge crowd of people gathered out. And, and what they had, you know, to everyone's credit at ILM, what, what's great about working there is all the artists are just so dedicated to what they do and they just love it. You know, they love doing Doing what they do and when it came to this problem of how are we going to solve the fact that you know so many different people need to touch this and there was no nobody was saying you know this is not my responsibility they were all saying you know what can I do and they basically came together on their own every morning and they had sort of a show within a show they had this huge meeting outside my office and they would just talk about for that day who was going to do what at what hour and then that was going to go back to so and so and he was going to do the rocks and then so and so was going to put the snow on it and you know, it was just an amazing, amazing team effort to get that that chasm to open up like it did. And I think the, um, you know, the end result is spectacular. I, I, the overhead shot, we, we all absolutely love that shot where it's, it separates. And, um, you know, the forest worked really well as a set, but obviously when you get into those, those hugely complex wide shots, you know, we, we kind of replaced everything. But um, again, having all of that reference of what it really looked like on, on set was extremely helpful. Um, for us as well, but um, yeah, just a massive amount of snow and ice and rock and um, sim work. And a, and a little silly detail, but just for fun, uh, uh, the close-up when Ren is pushing her back and she has that moment where she closes her eyes and a few of the shots where they were uh, fighting, um, we actually shot after the fact at, at, at Bad Robot um, in Santa Monica and we, we knew that we, we you know, where these things would go and what it was gonna, what it was looking like, and th they were like seamlessly integrated. So it's just fun to see like some shots are completely digital, the big wide. Some shots, you know, we did on the on the stage in camera. Other shots we did, you know, obviously set extension when you were looking, you know, m more uh, towards the the lights and the ceiling. And other things we did, it it felt like in our garage, um, you know. And 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 it it just it it there was a, a feeling working on this movie the unbelievable technical advances and the, like I said, thousands of people working on it, there was oddly, during the entire shoot of this movie, a kind of homespun feeling that, the, that there was a kind of practicality where everyone was there, you know, it, in a way making this little movie that we knew was part of something that was bigger than all of us. It was a very interesting experience. Uh, there were a couple of hands up in the, in the back there. Oh, well, in the meantime, since you're so far away, Ben, you, <coughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I heard you mention about the, the, the intensity of the schedule. I was curious how intense was it, like how much ramp up time you got for visual effects, special effects, and the film itself, and if it was, and if you considered it to be like an average ramp up time, or did, did this film get more or less time than you're accustomed to for ramp up? Well, on the visual effects side, I think, you know, I mean, I, I, Rod, Roger was working with JJ for a couple of years at least, you know, on, on this. And, and I think, you know, he, he was well into it. And then I've been on it for over, you know, probably a year and a half. Um, and, and I think we were, you know, to JJ's credit, brought really early in, into the process. And visual effects have always been a big, um, you know, part of the process and collaborator on, on, on these movies. And I think that... Um, I would call it a, a normal amount of time, I guess. But I think the one thing that was a bit different about this film is just that we just knew we wanted to do it as many times as it took to get it right. So I think the pressure came more in the form of, is this the right version of the shot? Is this, you know, is this the best it can possibly be? And we put that pressure on ourselves, and that's great. And um, but it, was, it wasn't so much the schedule pressure as much as it was the pressure. You know, just trying to get it right. And, and I think that's a welcome kind of. Um, problem to have because you know you're afforded the opportunity to actually do things the right way and I think 
you know, um, you know, time constraints aside, I think uh, we absolutely felt like we had we had time to get this thing done correctly. So, well, for the creatures, we had about twenty weeks, which is a, 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 a it's that's probably pretty normal. Um, however, there was a, a horrifying change to that uh, time frame in, in that um, uh, the first sequence was Abu Dhabi. Uh, originally, that wasn't going to be the way. Uh, things take six or so weeks to ship to Abu Dhabi, so we had to uh, push things much quicker to get to that point. So um, it was it, 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 the thing uh, 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 which is interesting about animatronics is that it doesn't matter how many times you do things; everything or uh, each new thing presents with a new challenge. And um, I think people, when they come around a workshop, begin to understand a little bit at the sort of the crisis level of management that you need to do in order to be to, to make each creature happen. It, because we're a manufacturing process, every process has to happen, um, you know, almost on the hour in order for the next process to take place. So we, we're building one-off prototypes. So um, it was, you know, we had a, it was a, a, a great period of time, uh, but what we eventually did was we ended up building as per the shooting schedule. So we were always just a few weeks behind when those characters would be required, um, uh, which is uh, not always typical. Often you will build the characters all up front, so everything's finished before you start shooting. Uh, so to some extent, there was a lux there was that luxury that we could we could look towards where each sequence would come and build the, design the characters, have JJ sign them off and approve them, and then go ahead and build them uh, just in time to be able to stick them in, in, in before the shoot started. I think, you know, Neil hit it on the head there, everything somehow always gets done on time. And you, you, you know, you develop it with JJ, like Ray Speeder, that was quite an ongoing thing. Uh, but you know it, it evolved and evolved and it, you know shipping out to Abu Dhabi as Neil says was was a bit tricky uh, There was one weekend where I had to fly out there just to meet uh, The military guys and the police guys just to talk about explosive license So it was a day travel out there day travel back, uh, but when we got back it was all signed and we were ready to go, but um, I, th I think To be honest it was the perfect schedule for me. It's uh, everything we were ready for everything um, It worked out great That means they'll take a bit of time off the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Sorry about that. Who do you got up there, Ben? Okay. Well, last question. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna. Okay. Have to first of all, I want to say this is the fourth time I've seen this movie, and it gets better every time I see it. So, I bravo. Agree. Thank you. <laughs> Um, my question is for JJ. Uh, how much of the story was sort of germinating in your head during your life? Like, if I ever got the chance to do like my dream job and work on a Star Wars movie, or did it was it all a collaboration when you and your other writers came together and it just was born from that collaboration? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, for seeing it four times. Um, it's uh, more than I've seen it. Um, uh, the um, uh, the truth is, I, I hadn't. I hadn't really thought about it that way. Uh, for me, it, it was sort of, it was done. And it, it was in a weird way part of the reason why <clears throat> when Kathy Kennedy uh, came to, to talk about doing Star Wars, I, it, it wasn't like, uh, my knee-jerk reaction was uh, no thank you, partly because I'd been involved in some other uh, sequels and I, I, I you know, love Star Wars so much and it was intimidating um, and I didn't really, feel like, oh, there's an obvious story I, I know I'd want to, to tell. When we sat down to talk about it, and I knew that uh, Michael Arndt and Lawrence Kasdan, who was uh, sort of an, an icon for me, um, was going to be working on this, and we started talking about what it would be like 30-some years uh, after Return of the Jedi. And the idea that this would, of course, be a story, as Star Wars is, a generational story about new young characters, the idea that there was this young woman, it was... We didn't know her name was Ray. We didn't know her story yet. But the idea that there was a young woman who was out in this universe and didn't even know herself that she was in Star Wars, that she was in that Star Wars universe, was so exciting to me. And the idea that someone that young might not know about Luke Skywalker or might not know that he was, that he was real. It might be a myth. Who knows what's happening? It just started to become the most delicious opportunity. Um, and the crazy thing is, 
you know, at, at, at every turn on this movie, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> at every turn on this movie, um, both in terms of talking about the story, collaborating with people uh, like Lawrence Kasdan and Kathy, um, you know, these amazing artists, the, the, the cast, uh, the established char characters and, and the new, at every stage, sound, mixing, music, um, it's been this, the same feeling that I had that first day with Kathy, which is a little bit of disbelief that you get to work on continuing a story uh, that George created that we all, or so many of us love, um, but also that, that we're in such good company. Uh, I can't tell you how many times, especially in the past three or four months, I've been asked by journalists, uh, how do you deal with the pressure? How do you deal with it? Oh my God, the pressure must be overwhelming. Uh, like, can you sleep with all the pressure? I mean, the questions I've been asked about pressure, at a certain point I'm like, I gotta have a heart attack because <laughs> this is literally, maybe I should be feeling like, and, I, and the reason that I wasn't overwhelmed by the pressure, I think, is because I would look around. Like, any time I would think about it, I would look around at the people I was working with, uh, in the visual effects reviews with, in the creature shop with, uh, working you know, with in, in post on the mix, you know, I, I could always turn to any of the people, and there were so many, who, all of whom were looking at each other in the same way, with a kind of mutual respect, kind of like we're in this campaign to do this thing together, um, and we're gonna do the best job we can, and I know that that's, I've been very lucky to work with great crews, we all have, but there was something about this project that was so special, and, and really like emotionally meaningful. And, and it, it started on the day Kathy came to have this conversation and it continues right to this moment. And I'm, I'm grateful to all of you and, and to everyone who worked on the movie because we got through it, not, not just you know, because it was what we were tasked with, it, we got through it because it's what we cared about. And that is a very rare uh, experience that I think has, for me at least, has spoiled me for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, we're, uh, we're running out of time here, but I want to thank you all for taking uh, oh, your you. Sunday you. off and, 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 and spending it with us. Um, really a fantastic film, and it deserves all the success it's got. Thank, thank you, you so guys. much. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.